Well, here we are once again with Motivation Monday and your 15-minute quick study. Um, this is going to be session eight. Can you believe it? We've already into week eight of these 15-minute quick studies. And so I'm excited that we're looking at it like it's motivating us for Monday and motivating us for the week because we want to bring you hope and encourage you, and that's why I'm here. So I'm so excited that you're here with me. And I look forward to that. Hey, Cynthia, it's good to see you. And LaShira, I'm going to see her um, next weekend. She has a wonderful conference with William Paul Young. And you need to connect with her. Her name is LaShira Lee. If you'd like to go to this conference, I'll be there. Um, and it's um, March the 8th and 9th, or 7th and 8th. I think it's 7th and 8th. LaShira, let me know what that is. If you'll just type that in, I'll make sure I get that out to them and um, do a little um, promo for you because you do not want to miss William Paul Young. For many of you who read The Shack, um, it was great. He also wrote Eve and a couple other books. I think one other book maybe that I read, but I can't think of the name of it. But anyway, so while she's typing that to me, let's go ahead and open in prayer and then we'll get started, okay? Father God, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you that you have already saturated the room with your presence Father, I pray that you would just be in my mind and my heart and my spirit and that you would not let a word roll off of my tongue or out of my mouth, Father, that it's not from you. Father, I pray that you would let all of us hear what you're saying to our hearts and let it just be motivating and full of hope, Father, as we think about what it is you want us to know about you this week. Father, we love you so much and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And there's Emily. So good to see you, Emily. Okay, so let me just tell you kind of what's been rolling around in my heart. And it's been almost two weeks. This coming Wednesday, it'll be two weeks. I was at a writer's conference in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And the pastor talked about uh, the path of life. And, I, you know, I've heard about the path of life. We know about the path of life. But he said something that was just very, it just kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And I'd never heard anybody talk about this. Maybe y'all have, but I hadn't. But he said, you know, there's two ditches on the path of life. One on one side is legalism. And on the other side is lawlessness. And so often we'll fall in the ditch on those two things. And I thought that's so true because everything that I could think about fit in those two categories. And of course, legalism, the definition is, it's excessive adherence to the law. And we know who was legalistic, don't we? We know um, in the Bible, Jesus talked many, many times about the Pharisees and their legalism. And he would get so angry because they did not know him and he was right in front of them. And so we know that you can memorize the whole Torah like the Pharisees did, and still miss Jesus. Now, how does that happen? How does that happen if the Torah and the Old Testament, all it was is a prophetic, you know, um, prophecy of things to come, or I should say prophetic, but the prophecy of Jesus to come. How did they miss him? Well, because they were putting it in here, and it had not transferred down to their heart. And see, my friends, when we know the word, it's not just enough to know it. It has to be in our heart. We have to live it. We have to carry it out. We can't just know it. And that's when we get caught up in legalism. And, and, I'm, and I'm sad right now because I just heard a report today about how a very prominent religion in this world and some people that are in that religion who are speaking all the things that we want to hear and they're saying all the things that they think we, you know, is about Jesus or that we want to hear about Jesus, but they're not practicing it. And how often do we run into people like that that are saying all the right things, but they're not living it? And today, I mean, part of my prayers were just crying out for the children being affected by this. So they, that's one of those ditches is legalism. And I'll tell you a story in a little while, but I want to go ahead and give you some scriptures to kind of encourage you about why we need to stay on the path of life and what it looks like. I found it very interesting when I was studying the scripture and put in about the path of life. And here's a couple of the scriptures that I've got. So if you've got a pen and paper, you might want to jot this down. 
And by the way, if you're watching this, you might want to share it too so that other people can see it. Because I feel like what we're doing in this 15-minute quick study is I'm here to encourage you. And I feel like we need to get this right. As we get closer to the end of times, I feel like we've just got to know. We've got to know Him and we've got to just stay clear on this path. This is how we do it by spending time studying what He has to say. So here we go. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So not only will he make us know the path of life, he will fill us with joy in his presence, which we experience when we're on that path of life, and he gives us eternal pleasures because they come right from his right hand. So that's those are some benefits of being on that path of life. Psalm 37, 23. The first one, of course, was 1611, and this is Psalm 37, 23. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he stumbles, he will not fall. The Lord upholds him with his hand. The Lord makes firm our steps when we delight in him. And see, that was one of the things that Pharisees, they didn't delight. It was work. Setting the Torah was work for them. They they did it because of, they were concerned about the consequences or they were concerned about, you know, not knowing him, which is so often how we react when we first become Christians because we want fire insurance. We don't want to get this wrong. We don't want to burn up for eternity. We want to get this right. But, it can't just be in your mind. It has to be in your heart. So if you are one of those people that have studied, and I, listen, I was one of those people, so I'm talking to you from experience. If you're one of those people that you're, you're angry at God because you feel like you're doing all the right things and you're being obedient, but you're not seeing anything from it, ask yourself if it's transferred from your head down to your heart, okay? Because frequently it doesn't. And so we want to make sure we get that right. Okay, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. So guess what that means? If we think we're walking the path, but we're not reading the word, then we don't even have a light on it. <laughs> we're walking in the dark. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but when I'm walking through my house at night in the dark, I can't see much, okay? I can't really see anything until my eyes adjust. And even at that, it's still dimly lit, isn't it? It's not clear. So you've got to have your word. You've got to have the word. You've got to be reading it, and you've got to be doing it every day, or else you don't have your lamp on. You don't even. You're not even carrying a lantern, okay? And you want to be able to do that. If you've ever gone camping, you know how important a flashlight is or a lantern is because it is dark when you're out there. And I'm laughing. I hope y'all are laughing too, because we just don't think about these things sometimes. We read these scriptures so much, they're not even penetrating. It's like they're falling off because we're not concentrating on what they're really saying. And so you got to have your word, okay? And Proverbs 3, verse 6, it says, and all your ways submit to him or acknowledge, and he will make your path straight, right? You have to submit to him or acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been on a, a curvy road in the mountains, you are, you are longing for it to be straight because especially if it's uphill or it's narrow, you wish you were on a straight and narrow path, and we want God to keep those roads straight. Psalm 25, verses 4 through 5 says, Show me the right path, O Lord. Oh Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Show me the right path, O oh Lord. Do you know how many people I get that come to me and go, Hey, Ann, I don't know what to do. Can you help me? Can you show me the right way? And the first thing I say to them is, What is God saying to you? And usually they'll go, Well, I haven't heard from him in a while. Or he's not really saying anything. And I'm like, Are you reading your Bible? And you, what, are, what are they telling me? No, they're not reading it. Listen. Maybe you struggle with reading the Bible and understanding what it says. If you do, 
find a Bible study to go along with the Bible to help explain it to you. Or pick up a book that will help you. I, I read about 10 books every day for my quiet time. I probably read like a devotion every day. Several of them, I think four or five of them are devotionals that I'm reading at the same time. And then the other books are like where I'm reading a chapter or a section or whatever so that I'm, I'm hearing, you know, what other people are discerning as they're reading the Word. And then I'm reading the Word. I'm reading several chapters out of the Word every day. And so it's so funny how when I pick up those books, and y'all probably can relate to this, that I will be reading those things and they all fit together. It's almost like the Lord has just perfectly selected those things for me. And, he, and I hear him talking and I write those things down. And I love that. I love when I hear him. You know, and the way you do that is you spend time with him, as we know. And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir, but hopefully you're getting something new from this because these scriptures are amazing. Psalm 37, 31 says, the law of his God is in his heart and his steps do not slip. Remember what I said about it's got to be in your heart. When you know it in your heart, your steps won't slip. You won't have to worry about it because one, you're going to have a lamp, right? You're going to be on the path. You're going to, the word's going to be in your heart. He's going to bring something to mind. You're not going to slip off in the ditch, right? Because you're going to know what it says. You know, the truth sets us free as we know. And it, and it just dispels those lies. It's like we know what a lie is when we know the truth. We, we are a, much better to decipher. We can much better decipher, I should say. Isaiah 26, 7 says, The way of the righteous is smooth. O upright one, make the path of the righteous level. In other words, you're not going to have some big boulders in the road. You're not going to have some roots sticking up. You're not going to have um, pebbles under your feet that are going to be ucky or thorns or anything like that. It says it's going to be smooth. And it's going to be level. Wow. Come on now. This is good stuff. And then, of course, Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14 says, and we probably have all heard this one, and this one's kind of scary for me. I've heard it for years. I want to make sure I'm in it. It says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. That always made me sad because I was like, Lord, how many people are going to be lost? How many people are going to be on that wide road? You said there's going to be a lot of people. Am I on the narrow road? Have I gone through the narrow gate? And that's been the cry of my heart. Lord, I want to make sure I'm on that narrow gate. Well, you won't miss it if you stay close to him. If you are on the path of life, you will not miss it because those who search with him for him with their whole heart, they will find him. Remember, he says that if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Proverbs 23, 19 says, listen, my son, and be wise and set your heart on the right path. One of the stories I heard the other week, and I've got to share this really quick, was about somebody who was known worldwide as an athlete. Everybody, if I mentioned his name, you would know who this person was. Great calling of God on his life powerful minister of God, had such influence. Still, there are records held by this person. Followed the way of the Father for a long, long time, but then he got off the path. He went into legalism. He started going under the law instead of re realizing that he was under grace. He got real stuck over there, and what happened was he ended up having a heart attack and die, died. And so we don't know if he got back on the path we don't know how the Lord feels about that, but we do know that he walked away from grace. I don't know what to say about that. I'm not saying I judge him, but when we die or when we go, we want to be on that narrow, we want to be on that narrow path. We want to know that we're in the right place. So it's a daily walk, my friends. The other ditch, which is lawlessness, some people say that hyper grace is that in that ditch. Because what it basically says is. John 3, 16, I believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Some people believe when they say that, that's all they have to do. They feel like they can go out and live their own life and live it without knowing or saying anything else with Jesus Christ. 
And that's wrong because Jesus never said that. He never said that to any of his 12 disciples. What he did say was, come and follow me. Didn't he? He didn't say, stay where you are and live the life that you're living and, you know, I'll see you later. That's not what he said. He tells all of his disciples to come follow me. Am I saying there's anything wrong with that verse? Absolutely not. We should all know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed that him should not perish. We all know that. But Jesus says we're to come and be his disciples. After we know who he is, after we see him, we need to come be his disciples and stay on that narrow path. And it is a daily walk, my friend. Well, I'm going to read you a funny joke real quick before we close. And it, it's funny, but it's sad. And then we'll close out with something good. But anyway, a preacher was visiting a man in prison. And he said, when you were tempted, asked the minister, why didn't you say, get thee behind me, Satan? I did, replied the prisoner. But Satan said, it doesn't matter who leads since we're both going the same direction. Wow. Don't let that be you. Don't be going the same direction as the enemy. Be on the path with God. Trust him with your whole life. Follow him. Be a disciple. Do you remember all the things? It'll be a smooth path. It'll be level. You won't trip up. You won't slip. Remember, he'll give you eternal treasures that are at, the, at his right hand, and it will be pleasurable because his presence is there. I pray that gives you great hope. Don't waste another second, another day. We never know how much time we have, and we want to make sure we are on that right path. I pray you have a great week. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you next week. Good night.